You know, I was thinking of doing this on simultaneously, making it a live podcast on Clubhouse. I kind of decided against it for this time because I don't want to. Yeah, I, really, I really don't feel like experimenting stuff right like now. that using the, the Clubhouse interface. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's. I don't see why not. It's just like a. I mean, I have my core audience here just on audio platforms for tradition, traditional audio platforms for podcasts. But I think at Clubhouse, I would tap into a completely different and new audience. So I yeah, think it's a different long scene. Term. It's a totally different scene. Yeah, exactly. Well, hey, man, we'll rock and roll. I'll do a, uh, a soft intro here and then, yeah. Cool, cool. Cool. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Jordan Paris Show for another episode. I believe this is going to be episode 241, episode number 241. Here to discuss the future of conservatism, where we go from here, all things conservatism, really, and Antifa. I hope we can get to it all. Uh, I have with me to discuss this someone I call my 610 amigo because we were born uh, a town over from each other, uh, 13 years apart. We overlapped for a couple of years, but uh, he's from Norristown and I am from Collegeville, Pennsylvania. And so we both have 610 numbers. That is Jack Posobiec, the correspondent for OAN, and uh, he's really my favorite follow on Twitter. Uh, he's got 1.2 million followers there as we speak. Really uh, prolific with just the amount and the quality of material that he puts out there. Highly recommend you follow him at Jack Posobiec. If you don't know how to, if you're if for some reason you're not familiar with him and you don't know how to spell the last name, P O S O B I E C. Jack, welcome. Oh, wow, Jordan, thank you. I mean, uh, boy, I really hope I live up to that intro there. But then, then again, if you're a guy from from Collegeville, you understand that's pretty much how it goes in the six one zero. Yeah, you know what's amazing to me, Jack. I mean, you're you're so much more famous than I. And I hate to use the word famous, but so much more famous than than you know I am. And yet, I I probably have a bigger ego than than you. And that's a really good reflection of you. You have like, I feel like you have very little ego. It just doesn't come across when you're talking with people, either, you know, with me or as I mentioned to you yesterday in your conversation with Zuby, like you're just a really humble guy. And, and I don't say that lightly. Well, no, I appreciate that. And it's, um, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, 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 look, I'm a Catholic guy from the Philadelphia area. I say my rosary every morning. You know, I try to teach my kids about, you know, doing the sign of the cross before they, before they eat and all. And, you know, it really just comes also from, I think, trying to really having that that inner locus of energy so that when you're inward focused, that you're doing your work, you're doing your mindset work, you're doing your mentality work inside, you're doing that internally so that externalities and different energies that might be, you know, kind of coming at you, whether good, bad, whatever it is, you're you're distancing yourself from them from on an emotional and a psychological level so that um you you're not really subsuming your energy to that of of another's will or an external focus whether it be the media whether it be you know like when i was in boot camp having you know someone screaming in your face from two inches away you know that you just you just understand that these are all things that are occurring they're occurring for various reasons and for various uh, pressures, whether in society or conditions that have gone on throughout history. So this is this is sort of your role to to play and you, you have to decide where to go from there. But once you kind of understand that, once you master a lot of that, there's a lot of mastery of self that goes into that. And I'm, I'm not saying I'm there, of course, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if it's like a Tibetan monk kind of thing. I'm definitely not on that level. But it's it's along those lines, this idea of you are going to be a practitioner of, of stoicism rather than someone who's constantly mm. reacting to things, which is funny because I would constantly get people who tell me, they say, well, I watch your, I read your Twitter and you're, you know, you're on there a lot. You're always reacting to things. You know, I, I read a different voice in my head when I read you than when I watch one of your videos or listen to an interview, because that's just never how I perceived you. And then I said, well, well what were you basing that perception on to begin with? Right. That's, that's just text. It's a text platform. So it's, it's always very interesting for me to, to kind of go from, from one medium to another. I didn't plan on going down this route with you, Jack, but you mentioned mindset work. And I come from 
the world of self-hope. I literally wrote a book about mindset years ago. And so I come from that world. Before I got very disillusioned with it and self-help and whatnot, uh, I, I do come from that. So I actually do want to kind of go down that because I think it intertwines in a unique way with politics where I would love to hear your perspective more about that mindset work, more about that stoicism and and how you use that in the world of politics in the sense that I feel like when you focus too much on politics, I, it just brings you down emotionally. It brings down your energy levels. It makes you angry and and in a complaining victim like like oh the the Democrats here look what they did this time. It's always like and I wonder like is it ha- is it is it possible to be happy to live a happy life with normal blood pressure and also report on politics and consume politics like is it is it possible can you enlighten me here well i would say it's it's certainly possible but if you you really do have to do a lot of work constantly to to kind of push your put yourself aside from the things that you're focused on um and and get your priorities in order right we have we all have maslow's hierarchy of needs to to deal with and once you're making sure that all of those needs are met if you are conducting that if you're getting your food you're getting your rest you're eating right you know, I'm actually since since it's Friday in Lent, you know, I'm not I'm not doing any meat today. I actually I started fasting on Fridays last year during Lent, um, just the whole day. I do a 24 hour fast. I actually start the night before and then I go into the next day. And Very healthy to do that. Once I've a been week. I've been continuing it. I mean, it's also not only is it healthy, but hey, once once you hit 30, uh, you know, your body starts changing on you and what you eat and what you put in is it's very much affects what you do. Um, and that only, you know, continues and that that gets it to be an exponential graph as your life goes on. So as you get older and we're all getting older, folks, that's, you know, you're never going to be as young as you are right now. So once you maintain that perspective, I think, on life and understand sort of your role in life is what you make of it. Yes, there are going to be external factors. Is it nature versus nurture? Well, it's both, right? There's nature and nurture. And I think that's the answer to the question. It's not a debate. It's an acceptance that we are what our parents made of us and we are also what our environment made of us it all it all goes into this giant you know sort of uh jambalaya pot that is the human psyche and the human mind and so once you kind of realize who you are then you can start to make those decisions and you know you should be as well uh, cognizant of your decisions and accepting that you know your decisions are going to have outcomes whether it's a career decision a relationship decision um interpersonal decision with you know one of your buddies and and or even just a basic opportunity cost right you know there's no such thing as a free lunch you're going to do something for an hour you can't do something totally. else for an hour so once you understand that and you're having you know the idea of low low time preference you know knowing that you know return on interest is something that you need to focus on when it comes to your time. Look, we all get 24 hours in a day. It's up to us how we spend them. Simple as that. So you, Jack, I mean, this is a very forward question. I think a lot of people would answer that answer it the, the right, the, the, the same way in a similar way. I mean, you, are you, are you happy or are you continually frustrated? The Democrats, the de- what did they do now? They were, like, what well, is I love your what I do. I, I daily? I love what I do. I, I think, yeah. I think it's great because I, I don't necessarily consider myself as someone who has to, uh, you know, constantly be quote unquote owning the libs or defeating the Democrats, whether it be at the ballot yeah. box or in a particular policy debate. It's, it's more about this. There's this idea that it's all left versus right, left versus right, but that's not really how I look at the situation. Yeah. I view it as there is the left, and this gets into your earlier question about conservatism, but there is the left, there is the right, but there's also the middle, right? There's just that sea of normies, of people who are just sort of, you know, they check in, they check out of politics, the sort of, you know, what I would call mid-information voters. They, you know, they maybe read a couple articles about something and think, hey, I'm good to go. I read up on that, right? So... The idea is then for someone who has amassed information or has amassed a filter on how things are operating, power structures in our country uh, and in our world, to then go to those people in the middle and say, hey, here's what's really going on, right? Let, Let me reveal something to you. Can I reveal a small piece of information to you that might change your perception on things? And then you can decide after that, you know, who 
uh, in politics you want to support or if you want to continue following me or you want to go follow somebody else who completely disagrees with me that's fine but i'm just gonna i'm just gonna drop this little nugget of truth this you know pearl of wisdom out and and see how it goes and so for me that's why i do what i do it's, it has nothing to do with necessarily yeah. like oh i'm gonna beat the dems or or, or something like that now obviously sure. you know long term i hope that that creates a better society for myself for my children and for everybody's children i, I would th i would hope that that's the basic um yearning of anybody who, who enters into the political process or the or the media information world but you know you do get batters bad actors out there and so we, we 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 have to find ways to deal with them as well yeah speaking of these little pieces of information how much do you think jack of what happens on a daily basis in the political world is just political theater because i wrestle with this as well is it all just political theater you know especially when you see it like inauguration you see George Bush and you see the Clintons and you see all the cronies there and you, you know everyone getting along and it's like you know I, I wonder I mean is this just like the WWE so there's an area in in the capital that's called um, the Russell Rotunda it's on the Senate side and where people do their their where senators go for their stand-up interviews is is usually there so the whole media will sort of align themselves out and you you know you'll have the Democrats will go to CNN or MSNBC and then the Republicans will go to OAN or, you know, Newsmax or Fox or one of the others uh, that's sort of on their side. And then they'll go do these interviews where they're just boom, 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 talking points and, yeah. you know, going after each other once in a while, sometimes by name, of course, as we know. But then the minute the interview is done, <laughs> when they realize that they're all standing there in the same right. physical space, they're all in the same area, the lights go out, the little red light on the camera shuts down. And they'll turn to each other and they might shake their hands. They might give each other a big hug. They might say, hey, good to see you. I hope to, you know, work together <laughs> on this committee thing that coming up next week. So there is a huge element of theater to it. And for anybody who's ever watched pro wrestling or even has an understanding of how the pro wrestling business works, there's a phrase they use for that in that world. It's called kayfabe. And kayfabe, it's kind of carny speak for the idea of, you know, this is part of the show. Like, this is yes. part of the show. This is part of the theatrics. This is a vaudeville act, you know, and we understand that. And we hope that some members of the audience understand that as well. But maybe there's others that just kind of go along with it because they're caught up in the act. And it's, it's interesting to kind of find the people who understand the kayfabe angle to politics, to American politics. But then there's also people in, in elected office that completely don't understand that and they actually are sort of you know chomping at the bit but you know there's other times where there's people where i'm, I'm just wondering like like nancy pelosi for example she totally understands kayfabe oh my um, gosh but wow you know somebody like and she's very 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 smart you know people who who discount her um do so with their own she's peril, a good really. actor she's good at acting she's she's fantastic she's phenomenal yes right she's from a very political family her father was a governor or excuse me the mayor of baltimore uh from the delisandra family and uh you know, you, you don't become the first speaker of the house as a, as a woman twice by not being good at what you're doing and understanding both sides of this. And so but then you've also got a sort of this this younger version. I, and I think you find this more with the younger crowd, honestly, like the Eric Swalwells or Ben Sass, you know, types that that actually do, uh, as an example, someone who, you know, people wouldn't wouldn't necessarily expect this from Jim Costa is like the nicest guy off camera. Hmm. He's he's just totally normal, totally personable. Hey, let's grab drinks. Just regular, totally normal guy. What about and a Mitt Romney? What about Mitt Romney? Like it's treason. Say again. What about Mitt Romney? No, I, I don't think Mitt, I I haven't had a lot of personal experience with Mitt Romney. I've met him a few times at you know different events and things. He doesn't strike me as the guy who who can turn it on and off. He doesn't strike me as the guy who looks at it that way. I think he's very wrapped up in himself. I think he views himself as a sort of uh, historical imprimatur of the principles of our Constitution and that his role is to uphold that throughout time. And that's he knows he's not going to be president just the same way his father was never president, George Romney. But, you know, that, well, that at least be. will get to be his his legacy. Yeah, I think he's wrapped up in a self-image pursuit. I, I, Joe Biden's very much in a, on a self-image pursuit. I feel like he's always been. 
Yeah, I mean, Joe Biden, look, the guy ran for president a million times. And hey, folks, you know, let's Joe Biden's a great example of somebody who, you know, don't quit. Don't totally <laughs> stay in the race. You know, there is an inspiring it's not part. The speedy hair, yeah. right? It's, it's, you know, in that sense, it, it's kind of inspiring. But, you know, what I'd also say with Joe Biden is he's a guy who he decided that he wanted to be president from an early age. He's dedicated his entire life to to climbing to the top of this mountain in politics. And now that he's that now that he's there, I can't seem to I struggle to find his definition for why he wants to be president. Totally. Right? Other than one be greater than FDR for itself. Right. To be greater than what does that even mean, though? Right? right. What does that mean for him? I don't know. I wonder. Yeah. And I don't think he does either. Like, at least, you know, one thing that you could compare it to Donald Trump. And of course, look, every they say, oh, Trump's a narcissist and, and Biden's a good guy. Like I, every politician, every person who puts their name on a piece of paper and says, I should be the leader has a, has an element of narcissism. I, to them, and to course. be president, I realized this a long time ago, or at least I thought this theory to be president. You have to be a narcissist. I think just plain and simple, you have to be to seek out that high of an office You've got to be a narcissist. Maybe there are a select few that have been president that that hasn't been the case, but I think overwhelmingly that that is. I don't know well, how well I can explain on, it, but that's early my on hunch. in American politics to go to from the historical route, um, it was considered it was considered bad form and rude to campaign on your own behalf for president. Um, the idea that you wow. would stand up and say, I should be president wow. was considered almost uncouth. And wow. it was like antisocial because the idea was that people should campaign on your behalf because to ask for it would be seen as as tawdry, would be seen as, you know, almost almost repulsive that, you know, we should be reticent of someone who is campaigning for the job. Whereas on the flip side now, you know, we look at it the other way around. And of course, you know, this was actually a huge angle from the Trump campaign in 2020 that, oh, Joe Biden's in his basement. He doesn't want the job. He's not campaigning hard. So it's very interesting to see how sort of the tide has turned. But of course, you know, society has changed a lot from that. Our social perspectives have changed a lot from that. And our, our idea of what makes a presidential campaign has certainly changed. You could never I mean, imagine campaigning without doing a debate right now. It's, it's something mm -hmm. we're like. 80% of voters agree that there should be debates. Like it would be unheard of for there not to be a debate. A quick plug. I should have done this 15 minutes ago. The Antifa. The oh, Antifa. Yes, your book is coming out. It was supposed to be uh, a date that is now pushed back. It was supposed to be right around the time that this podcast is going to come out. But it's being pushed back. What do you think, April? Yeah, well, right now we're looking at April. What happened was essentially January 6 happened and... I said, I went to my team and I said, guys, there's no way we can do this without discussing this event. It's yes. just, it's so huge. It's so seminal. There's various, um, what we would say, lines of operation that went into that event. Um, and I think it's something that absolutely needs to be touched on. Plus the fact, the the response of the FBI and the response of the U.S. government to it, um, this these lockdowns, um, these massive barriers that have gone up literally outside my building in Washington, D.C., the razor wire and uh, the National Guard troops. And what I've actually done now is I've gone in and I've obtained conversations, the actual readouts of conversations between President Trump and the head of the FBI. This is stuff that's never been discussed before regarding all of this regarding antifa regarding the domestic terror threat everything that's going on in portland the what was it between the president and ray that led uh, essentially the fbi to not be interested in going after antifa for years and years of violence but then suddenly to crack down so hard on you know in right. many cases peaceful protesters whose only real crime was trespassing inside the u.s capitol now obviously right. there were some there was there were people that crossed that line into violent criminal activity and certainly yep. you know they've all been arrested and fine sure no problem it's, but why is it that there's this massive double standard from the fbi so yeah it, so we wrote that chapter i wrote well the i want to comment it's it's bizarre that yeah you know people say oh the the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer, 93% were peaceful. Well, yeah, if you do the math, it adds up to over 300. Well, I mean, 7% of those violent. Yeah, and th so over 300 protests, Black Lives Matter protests over the summer were violent. That's a lot. And then, so you got 300 plus, and then just one 
one incident on January 6th well, and it's like do. the war these are these are terrorists they should be off social media they they oh OAN Fox News and news they shouldn't have be, have Kate why why is why is Comcast disseminating this right oh my we god we actually had a right? US congressional hearing talking about censoring my cable news network I mean think about that it's, it's stupid it's, I mean, it flies in the we, face we live in we live in communist China now that's what that's where we live so <laughs> it, it, some, it feels like I, that sometimes. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but what we actually do in the book at one point towards the end, this, there's this massive appendix, and I go through every single one of those violent incidents from the summer of 2020, date, time, damage. So, you know, in the military, we would call it situa situation, action, outcome. And it's just a timeline of all the things that you've seen all the damage that was done to businesses and homes, all the people who died, you know, 30 plus people who died. And it's just there for anyone to see that, you know, this this narrative that we're never told that it, in fact, the New York Times referred to it as a conspiracy theory. They said there is a conspiracy theory that's believed. In fact, they were talking about Hispanics. They said, why were Hispanics voting for Trump and supporting him in greater numbers that we've seen than any Republican has seen? And they said, some Hispanic males believe the conspiracy theory that Black Lives Matter protests turned violent. That was what the New York Times wrote, word for word. Up is down, down is up. And so we just like, lay it out. We lay out the facts so anyone can see it so that you could hand. So when you're having one of those, you know, debates or arguments with, you know, the liberal in your family or the person who's, the, you know, I would say the mid information voter on the other side who has a different information funnel than you do, that you can hand it to them and say, hey, you know, I think that you have interesting things to say about the providence of the Black Lives Matter movement. But have you seen this report? Have you seen this information about the violence? And you can just hand it to them and say, take a look and and you know what, what's your response to this and there's it's so that, it's just facts yeah. right it's just yeah. cold hard facts so that's your answer to january 6 plain and simple well the answer is that the situation was why did we have a situation in two in twofold right and i get into the fact that uh, the National Guard stood down. The fact that the Pentagon did not allow the deployment of 10,000 troops, as President Trump called for. The Secretary of Defense, Chris Miller, has stated that. Um, Mark Meadows also stated that, that that's what the president wanted. Um, the night before, he said, you need troops to be out there to defend this, the, the Capitol, period. And he didn't want any violence from anyone. Um, we get into the fact that the reason the Pentagon was reluctant to do this was because of the criticism that they had endured from the deployment of National Guard troops inside the U.S. Capitol, the you know, District of Columbia, within the summer of 2020. So because they had been criticized and because Barr had been criticized, remember they called it a photo op. They were trying to burn down St. John's Church, which is just north of the White House. They were trying to burn it down, and National Guard and Park Police cleared out the square and President Trump walked out and they called it a photo op rather than stopping the people who were burning down the church, right? It's, right? it's completely backwards. And so because of that, the U.S. military were reluctant to deploy National Guard troops to the U.S. Capitol before any of this violence took place. So we've entered in this situation now where in, in you mentioned Communist China, uh, where I lived for two years, lived in Shanghai, um, learned Mandarin while I was there, I was working for U.S. businesses, and, and I left and I said, we need to be care we need to watch out, they're coming for us. And in China, they And this have, is the 2000s. Yeah, this was, this was uh, 2007, 2008 era, uh, uh, pre-Olympics really. And so in China, they have state-run media, yeah. but in America, we now have a media-run state. We have a situation where the U.S. military yes. would rather pay attention to what CNN and the Washington Post are saying than be worried about the actual security situation in the jobs that they're supposed to do. Never mind everything that's going on in Portland that's continuing, by the way, under Biden, of nightly attacks, uh, firebombs, uh, people being, you know, agents actually being attacked by hordes of Antifa on a nightly basis. Uh, the George Floyd trial, which I'm covering right now, they have 2,000 National Guard that are suited up. They're around. They're around the courthouse building. It's sort of this 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 uh, government center rather than a traditional courthouse. But they're surrounding the building. They're surrounding it with barricades. And what are they worried about? Are they worried? Are they worried about Trump supporters going in and doing? Some? No, obviously not. Right? You know, this isn't the situation. But the problem is, and this is why I've always, all the way back in 2017, I held a rally at the White House. 
against all political violence. I said, the minute that you normalize any political violence from any side, it's going to create a downward spiral. It's called, and everybody talks about this, the downward spiral, spiral of violence. We can't have it. We shouldn't have ever let it take place. But when one side started to get accolades, right? Remember, punch, punch your Trump supporter, punch a Nazi. Jake Tapper from CNN was sharing memes saying punch a Nazi, talking about Trump supporters. And then, uh, or uh, uh, Chris well, Cuomo went out on CNN and said, you know, his brother's in a little bit of trouble right now. Chris, and, yeah, yeah, he would we say had some deplorable things at Maxine Not Waters. All and... punches are equal, right? So you're right. morally justifying violence. You're telling someone yeah. that if you join Antifa and you want to go wear black and dress like a ninja and go into the streets and attack people that you disagree with politically, that you'll receive accolades. You'll receive a CNN uh, you know, interview in some cases, like we held with this guy, Jaden X from, Ju- from January 6th, and that you'll be lauded in the press. So now it's justified. So you don't think there's going to be a reaction to that? That's the downward spiral of violence that we never should have started in the first place and that I've always been against. I mean, what is the... Is there a, an easy solution to to this? I mean, because as a country, we're in a pretty sorry state and everyone seems to hate one another and we're constantly scanning for like, oh, who's, I wonder whose side this person's on. I wonder if they're, I wonder if they're, uh, you know, a, a mask Nazi or, a, you know, it's like we're very divided yeah, right no, there, now. There actually are some, some sort of old pieces of wisdom that we that we I guess we've forgotten along the way to that that can really help us out here. So one of them and it's 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 very simple is is that is that violence is not how we solve things, right? Violence is never how we solve things. So there's this this photo of me uh with with an Antifa guy from the Lincoln Park statue in DC, which was actually the original Lincoln statue in Washington. It was it was uh, helped to be dedicated by Frederick Douglass uh, just a few years after Lincoln was assassinated and by an actor by the way. Um, and Hmm. it, it's a photo of me sort of facing off with this Antifa guy that wanted to tear down the statue and people have seen that they've seen the video. They said, Jack, why didn't you swing at that guy? Why didn't you take his hat off? You're a big guy. You're a Navy guy. You know, you did a little Brazilian jujitsu back in the day. Why not go for it? Right. And I said, to send a message, right. To send the message that not only to the world, not only to the media, and but also to my own children, that you don't need to solve every problem with fists, that you can use peaceful methods to talk things out or to, you can have a disagreement and that's fine, but we're not going to go to violence over that. So I wasn't going to go down to his level. And of course, that's what he wanted and that's what CNN wanted and everything else. That's number one. Yeah. Number And then of course, by the way, anyone who does use that violence, you use the force of law against them. Hundreds of people who attacked Trump's inauguration in 2016, well, really January 2017. Oh, yeah. January 20th, had their charges yes. dropped. Why? Because DC juries were all finding them not guilty, even though it's on camera, it's on footage, we can all see it. I participated in it. My my wife was almost a victim of it at one point um, when they attacked our, uh, our uh, we called it the deplorable ball, a sort of inaugural ball. All of this is in the book, by the way. Yeah. Um, they, they were going to put smoke bombs and, and butric acid uh, and use that in the, in the air system. We had rented the National Press Club on that, that night. Um, and then so they attacked our event. Then they attacked Trump's inauguration the night before. And all those people had their charges dropped, right? So when they say, well, what about political violence? They say, well, you have to go back and look at the start of political violence because political violence has always been justified against Trump supporters. And that's the problem. So you have to stop political violence whenever and wherever it starts, period, end of story. Follow the law, right? Enforce the law. Number two, the other basic thing that we need to remind everyone is that there are always two sides to every story, right? So George Floyd, great example. That's the case that's that's starting up right now. We're in jury selection. Was George Floyd murdered by a police officer who committed police brutality? Or do we wait for the autopsy to come out that says, well, he had a lethal dose of fentanyl in his system as well as methamphetamines and other things? Or is the truth somewhere in the middle, right? And so often it is right we should have a discussion philosophically about it, it often right? is in the middle 
So let's have a discussion about that rather than take one side and decide that that's the only thing we're going to listen to and then start burning down our cities because we're so mad about the police, right? Wait for facts to come out, wait to get the other side of the story. And that's, look, viral videos are going to keep coming out, right? We now live in a massively socially interconnected society. We live in a socially interconnected world. This has actually fueled the rise of populism. Uh, I've, I've said, I went to CPAC and spoke, and I said, if conservatives want to uh, build coalitions, they need to become populist. They need to move to the center on certain issues. I would point out economics as being a great example of that. Um, you should support stimulus. You should support unions for Amazon, these type of things. But when it comes to these, this situation with George Floyd, you have to say, look, there are two sides to every story. So understand that. Every viral video will have a second side of the story. Uh, another example is this, the the Central Park thing with the dog walker. Um, you remember what, you remember that one? You know what I'm talking about? Nope. There was a, so there was a story that came out uh, where a guy had filmed this this dog walker that he was very upset about because she was she was walking her dog in Central Park and. She had let her dog off the leash. She had thought she was alone in this one area. There's lots of nooks and crannies in, in Central Park. It's this huge area. But because she had let the dog off, he thought that he was, he was, he was a bird watcher. And I guess she didn't realize he was there and said, oh, you know, you, you need to put a leash on your dog. And uh, actually, there's not supposed to be dogs in here due to you know, COVID restrictions and all. And so rather than have a basic conversation about this, he then so the video we get the video we get is her freaking out calling the police and then him saying i'm filming you because you're calling the police on a black man right you're calling the police on a black man and you're a racist white woman who's calling the police on a black man when all i wanted you to do is put the leash on your dog right terrible sounds like a horrible situation my gosh they called her the central park karen it was all over the news what what do we do about this? How do how do you know what a terrible situation? I do remember this right? now. Yeah. Yes. What a terrible situation. Sounds awful. Then if you go to that guy's Facebook page, he actually added in a little bit more information. What did he write on his Facebook? He said, Well, before the viral video came out, I had said to her, If I come over and get that dog, you're not going to like what I do. And he admitted that he said that to her. Then he put his hand in his pocket and he said, I keep dog treats in my pocket when I go bird watching, just in case situations like this happen. And then I started to call the dog toward me. Wacko. And so in my head, I start thinking, well, wait a minute. If this was something that happened to my wife, because, you know, she walks with dogs sometimes. And I don't know if we, we live on a lake and I don't know if she always has a leash on. She, she usually does. But if some stranger came up to her and started calling the dog over and saying, you're not going to like what I do. Yeah, that's a threat. That's definitely unambiguously a threat. She felt threatened. Then she called the police. Then the viral video started. So a great rule of thumb of this is whenever you see a viral video, your response should, shouldn't be, oh my gosh, look what's on the video. The vi your response should be, gee, I wonder what happened 10 seconds before, 10 seconds after this started, you know? There's always two sides to every story, and we need to start teaching people that. And I really do believe it's a national security issue because you're now seeing people, uh, I mean, look at it, right? We've got our entire capital complex of the United States that's surrounded by barricades, surrounded by razor wire and National Guard troops because there are people that actually think, we call this blue anon now, this is a, this is a phrase that's been coined, we call it blue anon, that believe that there are uh, racist militias that are planning an attack on the U.S. Capitol. We've, we've been given no intelligence of this. We've been given no evidence to support this. We haven't seen anything about this, but doesn't matter. We say it's going to happen. And because the media says it's going to happen and we have a state-run media, or we have a media-run state, I should say, then there they are yes. every single day, 24-7, thousands of troops patrolling for nothing. Weird. Right. This is the world we live in. It's like it's we live, wild, we live in a banana republic. Yeah, yeah, it's it's bizarre. I can't even believe it's all still up uh, 51 days after inauguration or so. Yeah, I, I view myself pretty you crazy. Know, I would, I, you know, my for me, like the the perfect end to all of this is like, you know, me 20 years from now, or me even in my old age, saying, you know, 
we can never let this happen again. We can never let our country go down this road again. Right. That is a good good you know, scenario. So once you, that would be great. That's my that's sort of my visualized uh, endpoint, and then so you know how do I work back from there? Never yeah. let this happen again. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to move on. I want to talk about some other matters. What's your opinion of of Donald Trump? Was he effective? Was he not? Strengths, weaknesses, accomplishments, well, I think Trump failures. Advanced, your thoughts? The cause of populism by by about twenty years. I mean, I think this is something that sort of the modern vein of populism in the United States was started. Uh, and and define that for people who, sure. are, who don't know what populism is. Right, right, define right. That. So this is something that really got started, I would say, with the Tea Party or with Andrew Breitbart back in like 2009, 2010 time frame, 2012, of course, it was really ascendant. But overall, populism is the idea that rather than have an ideologically, having an ideologically driven uh, political movement, that you have a political movement that's based on pragmatism, that's based on people first, and that's based on the idea that our government should be working to serve the people it represents and only very little other basic functions. So this is, the, this is where the idea of, you know, why is the government bailing out these, these massive banks from 2008? That's where this idea comes from. Why is the government um, funding all of these forever wars that go into the pockets of Boeing and Raytheon um, that don't really seem to serve any purpose other than enriching these defense contractors and getting soldiers and Marines killed and you know sending people away from their families why is this going on when it doesn't seem to serve any purpose for the people who live here that have to deal with crumbling infrastructure have to deal with stagnant wages uh, and then you know going back to what I said about the bailing out of the banks we now have had negative interest rates for such a long time that my generation I'd, I'd consider myself an elder millennial or a centennial is another phrase that's out there you know, for someone who sort of grew up before the rise of the internet, you know, we've had to deal with the financial crisis and negative interest rates and the, its after effects in the exact time frame that we should have been hitting the workforce and starting to build capital. So we've seen we've seen a put off of wealth wealth creation for my generation. We've seen a put off of family formation, a put off of home ownership. You know, these basic wickets that you would normally hit on the way up. And so now, rather than have those things. You've got massive debts, most mostly in the form of student loans, which again are not. Oh, one point seven three trillion dollars in student loan debt nationwide. Right, uh, student uh, loan uh, debt, incredible. by the way, which is 40... non-dischargeable yes. in bankruptcy, the way every yes. other form one of the of only debt things. Is. And that's why universities continue to hike up the cost of tuition, no matter if it's a good year or a bad year. Because they know the kids aren't paying for it at the and end of the for, day. Yep, yep. Forty-five million Americans, though they owe an average of thirty-eight thousand four hundred seventy-four dollars. What a scam! What an absolute loan debt. scam that's been per perpetuated on the U.S. public. Absolutely. Go to college and get yep. a job. Isn't and that what we were all taught? You, you need this, or else you, you won't this be successful. Or we won't and even young see people, you, you need this, or yep. you can't have. Young a life. people are buying homes less often and later on in life because of, yep. in, in large part, because of this huge financial burden that is college. That, that's precisely the stuff I'm we're talking you. about, and I and. I'm here to tell you that I remember back in those days of the financial crisis when I had buddies that had graduated, they're were, they were about to graduate, and I would say to them, so what's your plan? Where are you, where are you going? What are you going to do? What are you going to work? You know, me, of course, I did what most people do, and I moved to China, and I said, hey, there's probably jobs over here. I ended up getting that work, but I, you know, obviously I, I go against the green. I've, I've kind of been doing that, kind of been a contrarian my whole life, I guess. But they would say, oh, well. I as well why don't I just go to get my master's degree and I'll just go back to more college. I'll get in more debt. I'll get another piece of paper and spend years of my life doing it. That um, isn't guaranteed to help me find employment, but I'll certainly feel really good about it. And I'll have a lot of fun doing all these studies. Um, I'm not really sure financially how this is going to work out. And I remember looking at them and thinking, this is crazy. This is nuts. Like what's your, mm. what's your goal? Your goal yes. shouldn't be, studying the, the goal of studying should be understanding right. so that you know when you're in that situation that to to earn a find a way to earn a living find a way to uh you know we, we again we, we've completely i think turned on its head the role of education in our society so this idea that education is to self-actualize yourself and find who you are and explore new horizons, right? But then you go to China and China says, China has something called the Gaokao. Are you familiar with the Gaokao? 
So the Gaokao yeah. is a system and the the origins of which date back all the way to imperial times in China. But what the Gaokao is, it's sort of your your high school um, your high school graduation test and which is also sort of doubles as your SAT or your college entrance test. 50% of people, 50% of students in China fail to achieve the the proper standard in this test. It's very, very high. And so because of that, and now keep in mind, they want to keep it high because of the population numbers in China. So because of that, only 50% of the graduates are then able to go into college. They're able to continue on. They're able to continue their careers at a higher level. So as you can imagine, because this one test is so important, you can only retake it a couple of times. There is uh, schooling prior to this becomes a seven day affair, 12 hours a day of, of study, hard science, music, languages, a uh, lot of STEM, obviously computer programming is becoming a huge, uh, a huge factor right now, robotics. Probably not there's gender nothing, studies. There's no gender studies. There's no critical race theory, That's any what I critical suspected. theories. It's all about how are you going to pass this test? And then when you go to the higher level, what type of engineering, what type of computers are you going to be able to study? Because really the entire Let's get ruling down to nucleus of, of China, the commanding idea of it is actually hyper-nationalism. We are going to make China great again. This has been, and I could have told you yes. that back in 2007, 2008, that obviously their methods are contrary to our, met to our methods and our way of life and our values and what we view as what makes a good society. But that being said, they are putting their sole focus on advancement and progression of their society rather than advancement and progression of these these ideological desires social pseudo social yeah. issues which is funny because of social course they're ruling issues. you know they have this sort of illusory title of communism and socialism they call it socialism with chinese characteristics uh, and um my girlfriend will be the only one who understands <laughs> cool, what you cool. just or, said. Probably. I think it's Zhongguo Tose. But uh, yeah, she would understand exactly what I mean. But they'll, they'll call it communism, but that's it's not really communism. There's no, there's no equality in China. Um, whereas in the United States, we say, well, we stand for freedom and, uh, and uh, prosperity. But obviously, not everyone in the United States is able to experience those things. Not everyone in the United States is able to have access to those things. There is rampant censorship in, in America. There's rampant censorship from yeah. not only yeah. the level of what you and I do for a living, but also from the level of you know, you, you can't say certain things in school. You can't say certain things in the workplace. You'll be canceled. You have a hate mob launched yeah. against you. Or, uh, you know, in, in our positions, we, you know, people will get what I call false reality attacks launched at you. Uh, Tucker Carlson is a great example of this. They said, oh, he said women shouldn't be in the military. Never said it. It was nothing to do with what he said whatsoever. He said our military should be focused on winning wars and protecting the United States rather than identity politics. They changed the context of what he said and launched a false reality right. attack on him. Right. So Donald Trump advancing yeah, the so cause Trump, of populism. Good thing. Trump's other... biggest successes in many cases were to say that you don't have to be ideologically driven anymore, that you can demand things of your government yes. and demand things of your pol politicians and demand yes. pragmatic, tangible results actually Tariq Nasheed who's a guy that you know he doesn't like me at all but this is a great thing that he says that I really like he says we want tangibles we, we demand tangibles the community wants tangibles we don't want your flowery language we don't want you saying you're fighting for us what are your tangibles and I think that's something that Trump really kind of brought along as well this idea that we don't have to vote for people just because oh they say these wonderful flowery things hope and change right that you actually provide tangibles. Right. <laughs> what are your tangibles that's number yeah. one number two Exactly. was he put the idea that there is fake news, that the media is corrupt, that oh, they yeah. are lying to you, that they are shading the truth, that they are conducting these false reality attacks. He put that front and center every single step of the way. He challenged the premises. He refused yep. to accept them. And that's something that's absolutely trickled down. And once, what's scary is that once they were exposed and came out of the closet, so to say, they've really, 
really ramped it up. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. I well, feel so what like. they're doing is right, so media they're, they're playing to an ever dwindling base, right? They know that there's, you know, a certain number of people, a certain percentage of people that just want that sort of rage bait against Trump. And they have a, they have a problem with that right now because he's sort of, you know, off the stage in a sense. He's like he's sort of in the wings. Right. We know he's there, but he's not there. So they're they're kind of trying to find their next Trump to be this person to hate. So whether it's Marjorie Taylor Greene yeah. or uh, Lauren Boebert or myself or Candace Owens or Tucker Carlson or. Jack, I gotta, yeah. I gotta put in here. I don't, I just don't think that it's ever not gonna be Donald Trump. But it's Trump, we, at least for the, not the next ins for Trump. four yeah, to ten yeah. years because They're, they can't find anyone that's I, at I, his level. Right, and I liken it to in 1984, they have every morning uh, the two minutes. Yeah, Emmanuel Goldstein for towards towards the enemy. Emmanuel Goldstein, yes, and he was like a former leader, like decades ago of of Oceania, and they just. Everything is Emmanuel Goldstein's fault. It th- it just doesn't even things that have like no connection is always the enemy of the state's fault. And the only difference is that now instead of two minutes, hey, it's twenty four seven three sixty five. Yeah, actually a great hey, example of that. I liken it to that. It's not going right away. Now, uh, going back to what we were saying about January sixth, and I talk about this in the book, um, the pipe bombing that took place um, the night before. There was a. Uh, pipe bombs placed at the RNC and the DNC, yet the FBI will go after all these MAGA grandmoms who are holding little American flags and walking within the rope lines, but they can't identify the pipe bomber. The FBI now just put out this huge press release saying, okay, we've got video of this person that we've we've sat on for weeks for some reason. You, You know, ask yourself why about that. But then we can't identify them ourselves, so we want you to identify them based on, and I love this, based on their gait and their their walk and their mannerisms right so it, think about what that does if you're someone who's in you know on that side of things right now suddenly you're thinking oh my gosh could that be my neighbor could that be this guy at work he kind of walks like that or this woman kind of walks like that because they said there's like some hip movement going on so people are asking is it like half the comments on this post are asking if it's a woman um, I, I don't prescribe to that, but you can see that what it's done, it's created a feeding frenzy now. Oh, could that be my wife? Could that be my husband? Could that be my significant other? And you're playing on this fear. You're using this fear of, as you just said, this Emmanuel, you know, Emmanuel Goldstein is out there. We've found one of his agents on footage. We've got to uncover them. Please help us out public. Find. We have to find the evil one. We have to do this. Meanwhile, it's like, Where's the forensics? Where's the CSI? Where's the NSA, you know, on all of this, right? You guys can pinpoint, you know, a terrorist 5,000 miles. I mean, I used to do that for a living, right? When I was in the IC, we could find people all the time. We caught body, you know, manhunting, um, you know, put warheads on foreheads on the other side of the planet. You tell me you can't find person in the United States Capitol, one of the most surveilled areas of the entire world, and you can't identify, you know, where did they come from? Did they get into a car? Did they go into the subway? What, you know, actually the subways were down. Uh, well, no, that was inauguration day, subways were down. So again, right, we have cameras all over the city. The idea that they couldn't track this person is, is ludicrous, quite frankly, it's absolutely ludicrous. And you know, what they're doing is they're only releasing bits and pieces of it because of what you just said. They want that Emmanuel Goldstein factor to come into it that there's an evildoer out there and and he's in our midst. Yeah. So make sure you watch out. Yeah. Do you think that Donald Trump will be the nominee in 2024? Well, I'll, Purely I'll, I'll speculatory go back here, to, but I'm curious to as to your, your first comment. question, and then I'll answer this part. So you also asked you where some of the weaknesses. And I would I would say also say that. Hmm. Um, yes, yes. Tangibles. I'd go back to that, right? Where are the tangibles? Where was fighting back against corruption? Where was actually putting some shackles on social media giants that have been fighting against freedom totally. of speech in this country? Where was standing up for freedom of speech as a civil right? Uh, were we able talk, to yeah. really affect um, the power and the influence of the CCP in the United States or in Hollywood? Uh, the influence they have over our our technology sector, over our media sector, and America's America's comparative advantage has always been psychological operations, and Hollywood's a major part of that, right? That's our greatest export around the world. I don't know if people realize that. Um, our ability to shape narratives and set narratives. Hmm. There, there is only one Hollywood in the world, right? There's one. 
right? There's, there's, I mean, yeah, there's Bollywood, yes. but you know, which is kind of fun sometimes, but it's, it's not the yeah, same thing. Right. Not the same. Um, and you know, Japan has some really, really good movies, lots of great anime, Studio Ghibli, and there's a new, um, the name escapes me at the, at the moment, but there's sort of a new, uh, successor to him that's really good. He wrote Your Name and some other things, but, um, the idea of providing those tangibles, and now that being said, there were very high tangibles that he he called for, um, but I think that was that execution was always the biggest issue with the Trump administration. So execution and then achieving those tangibles. I'm not saying that he didn't have people in his way. I'm not saying that you know he was fought at tooth and nail every yes. step of the way by elements of the U.S. government as well as elements of the media, elements of his own party. Sure, totally got that. Understood. Believe. I, yeah, the in, people in he surrounded cases, himself you know, with sabotage. He used to read that. I actually joked the other day to um, one of his former uh, advisors. I said, you know, he used to read that poem, "The Snake," on uh, on the campaign uh, trail. That you know, you knew. Why did you bite me, snake? And he said, looked at her and said, you knew I was a snake when you let me in. I said, well, you could kind of say the same thing about some of the advisors <laughs> in the White House. Uh, that you know, why did you hire snakes? He read in that the on the place? campaign trail. And so. That being said, would... that being said, if he wants to be the nominee in 2024, he will be, period. There, there is no other Trump out there in politics. There is no other Trump waiting in the wings. There is no other, no one else in the Republican side or the Democrat side that can do what he did or can match his level. And by the way, people are also starting to get this. You've seen Mark Cuban flirting with running. Matthew McConaughey is talking about running for governor in Texas. Totally. So people are realizing now that they can leverage their You've celebrity to run for political office. And I don't know how any traditional like Republican or any other traditional politician can match that kind of power, those those sort of persuasive and influence skills. Yeah. I mean, you've got like they, they look like lawn furniture compared to one of these guys. You know what I mean? Totally. Good analogy, man. If Mark Cuban were to become president, I mean, he's the polar opposite of, of Donald Trump ideologically. You know, he's what did he do the other week that uh, he he stopped playing the national anthem before basketball games at his arena. Uh, I think the NBA, to their credit, I don't usually give them much credit, but they actually push back. Well, on my it take on that is actually that. kind of interesting um, because, it, you know, Mark, I've actually met Mark. Yeah. I've interviewed him. I've had dinner with him. Um, really? And he's a smart guy. He's a very smart guy. And we didn't, he and I didn't have I've never totally. spoken about this, but um, I was wondering if him, saying let's not play it was a response to all the controversy surrounding it saying basically that look stand up sit down take a kneel raise a fist don't raise a fist lock arms etc what if we just don't do it and then we don't have to worry about it? so maybe i'm wondering if as a leader of organization he was trying to find a way out of the controversy by you know so, by just saying hey can we sort of sidestep the whole thing and just not have the conversation and the problem is that it's just it's so ingrained in U.S. culture. It's so ingrained in U.S. history at this point that that is what you do before a sporting event. That to not do so, I think it just it, it created too much of a backlash in and of itself. But I wonder if that was maybe where he was coming from on all that. Good empathetic view there. Very good, mature view. Uh, well, they say they say if you're if you're easily offended, questions. you're easily manipulated. Ah, interesting. interesting. Uh, what is your view, Jack, of deplorable Republicans, I w I, or Mark Levin would call them, uh, like Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, especially him? Like, how does, all I say is, how does someone like Adam Kinzinger ever, ever get something done? I feel like he's just on TV, on MSNBC all day. Like, how does he actually, like, Get well, that is what do you job. think I mean, of, that's, that's of his, people of Republicans? That's his, like, that's his yeah. role. That's he's, he's doing exactly what his donors pay him to do and his power base pays him to do. I mean, look, we still have a lot of moneyed forces in this country. Um, many of them tied, as I was talking before, were tied in that military industrial complex that was created. Eisenhower warned us not to go down this road. We didn't heed his warning. We, we did end up going with that. I mean, the Cheney's right. That name is ubiquitous for military industrial complex. You can go watch the movie Vice. Um, that Christian Bale did. Mm. So I think it's a, a very well done movie about about Dick Cheney and about his family, the way he threw his own daughter under the bus politically, um, coming out as a lesbian. 
uh, when she did because of because again of political preferences and because he's just sort of an amoral um, nihil- at the end of the day he's sort of an amoral nihilistic actor who wanted power and people like that tend to actually do very well in politics and this is goes throughout history right there have always been these sorts of players in royal families or various courts and uh, in Europe as you look at history and because they have no core their core is I want power right and so they will then be willing to do whatever it takes to get power uh, you know House of Cards is basically about this that you know there is no moral compromise on their part because there is no morality to speak of it's what matters what wins the game how do I win how do I get power it's as simple as that and so there are people like Liz Cheney, like Adam Kinzinger, who go along with it because they view it, again, as a path to power and influence. And I wish there was something more, uh, more interesting, but a lot of this stuff really just goes back to, you know, the sort of time-honored vices of the human conditions, money and power, man. Yeah. Uh, last topic I have. Hobbes, uh, what I say, I always like to say, you know, Thomas Hobbes, right? Hobbes always wins in the end. Human mm. nature is immutable. Mm. If you read the Bible, two thousand years ago, people were exactly we're prisoners the same of as human right nature, now. as we as are. Robert Greene, I believe, uh, would say. He wrote an excellent book, my favorite book of all time. Don't know if you've read it, The Laws of Human Nature. He also wrote the Forty Eight Laws of Power, as well. Pretty famous okay, that book. one. I've read, yeah. yeah, had him on the program. Of, I guess last year he had some really interesting things to say about social justice wars, even though he's pretty liberal. Anyhow. Well, they're, they're using the 40, yeah. you know, they're using the laws of power just as well as anybody yeah. else, probably better than anybody else at the, at totally. the moment. They are ascendant. No totally. Question. They're, they're following Saul Alinsky's rules for radicals to a, a T, whether they really know it yeah. or not. Why, why do people still talk about rules for radicals? Because it works. Yes. It's simple as that because, you know, why was it? And I'm looking here. I have it uh, framed on my wall. I've got the ticket stub for when I went to um, Shakespeare in the Park in 2017. What was the date? June 16th, 2017, Friday. And they were doing Julius Caesar, but they had done Caesar as Trump and his wife was Melania and they were stabbing him to death on the stage. And so I Is went that inciting and I, violence? I up. I precisely right you know nowadays we would we would immediately say oh that's inciting violence imagine doing that you know if they did that of you know hypothetically i'm not saying anyone should do this but what if someone did that of kamala harris and joe biden right what oh you're in trouble now you're really inciting right and so i went personally to that play and i stood up and i called out the entire crowd i called out the actors caused the whole scene (laughs) super viral online um And at the same time, though, you had conservatives, these sort of like old right, crusty conservatives. They're crusty, but even though some of them are are the same age as me, uh, 36, and they were saying, oh, we don't do that. Conservatives don't do that. Conservatives don't protest. We don't interrupt The kinder, gentler type. That's what the left does to us on campus. We should never do that. And they said, well, I was was in a debate with somebody about this. And it was funny to me. I said, what? Because I did something effective, right? You know, and they said, well, well, isn't that against the principle of free speech? And I said, no, no, not at all. Because they were exercising their right to free speech by conducting a play uh, murdering Trump every night. And this was gory, by the way. It was very bloody. It was like Quentin Tarantino level. And what I was doing was adding my free speech to their free speech, right? I didn't stop the play. I didn't shut it down. Right. I didn't, uh, you know, conduct any effort to stop them from performing it other than, you know, a pause. But what I did was I called them out. And that's what was effective because that went hyper viral. Very good. Jack, our last topic for today, social media and cancellations and social media censorship. How do you as someone who's relatively high profile, especially on Twitter, get away with it not being canceled um and i have a second part of the question worry about the first part right now but how do you advise like normal everyday americans go about social media especially americans with you know more with normal jobs and they rely on it and you so how do you get away number one if you're if you're a normie if you've got a normie job and you're you want to keep that job and you're going on social media be anonymous just just be anonymous it's as simple as that don't don't post anything politically under your real name. Uh, if you're a conservative in America right now, you're a second class citizen. 
You're, you're just a second class citizen. There's business class for everybody else. There's first class. You're in economy or whatever, like the back of economy is. That's well, you. I call so I call understand it your role. the underclass. Un yeah, perfect example. The, you are the underclass. You're second class. You are not. That's a great example of what's going on between Taylor Lorenz. So she's being, you know, saying, "Oh, I've been I've been criticized. I'm being." I've been getting harassed. People are so mad at me. How dare you? How dare you criticize me by name, right? And people are saying, wait a minute, isn't that what Taylor Renz does? She doxes teenagers. She goes after people by name. She lies about people. Uh, Mark Andreessen on Clubhouse lies about what he says mm. and thinks that nobody's going to call her out. But that's mm. but you guys don't understand. Taylor Lorenz is a first class citizen. We are all second class citizens. She's an aristocrat and you're a peasant. And because she has power and you don't, that the laws that she applies to you do not apply back to her. For you as a peasant or a serf to criticize an aristocrat is harassment and it's vile and it's wrong because she has a different set of laws than everybody else does. And this gets back to what I was talking about earlier about there sort of being this two-tiered system of justice in the United States. There's also a two-tiered system of social justice in the United States. So the only way you can trip anyone up with all of this is going back to those rules for radicals, apply their own standards to them. It's when people say, oh, you're just being, you're just saying they're a hypocrite. You're just using whataboutism. No, 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 no. I'm calling out their inconsistencies and their contradictions to say, how can you accuse someone of doing something wrong when you do the same thing yourself? And this is another thing I said at CPAC that a lot of people don't like. Uh, I didn't think I was going to get to it so quickly, but I said the only way to fight cancel culture is to cancel them back. The only way to stop someone from canceling you or canceling others is to cancel them back. It's as simple as that. And it's the basic same principle as mutually assured destruction. Why did the United States and the Soviet Union not go to nuclear war? Because we knew it would lead to an assurance of destruction of both yes. sides. It's, it's, it's basic, you know, game theory yeah. or, or the prisoner's dilemma, whatever you want to call it. Right. It's, it's this idea that if I do this, they will do it back to me and no, neither of us will get anywhere. That's the only way to stop it. I just hope everyone understands that because there is no trust right now. So the only way to do it is through MAD. Now, a great example of this is Alexi McCammond. So Alexi McCammond was a reporter for Axios. She was the one who was having a relationship with T.J. Ducklow. T.J. Ducklow is a deputy press secretary yes, of the Biden administration. Right. We were able to break the story that T.J. Ducklow was having this relationship, which is an obvious conflict of interest, and the fact that he had attacked a reporter from Politico, Tara Palmieri, who runs Political Playbook, one of the most powerful newsletters in all of Washington, probably the most powerful newsletter in all of Washington. Um, he had attacked her. He had sexually harassed her. He had used sexually charged language to attack her for, because she had found out about their relationship. And the White House covered for him. The White House covered for T.J. Ducklow, despite the fact that Joe Biden very publicly on January 20th had told us that if I see anyone mistreating anyone else, yes. that they are going to be fired on the spot. So it was Ron Klain, the chief of staff, who came in and said, look, even though Jen Psaki tried to protect D.J., Ron Klain came in and said, look, you got to fire this guy because that's, you know, that was your word, right? If you want the administration to have any credibility right out of the gate, you have to live up to your word. You drew this line in the sand. Someone has crossed it. What are you going to do, right? So that's number one. And because, and say so people said, oh, Jack, but are you, are you, are you canceling TJ Ducklow? Why are you canceling TJ Ducklow? And I said, I'm not canceling TJ Ducklow. I'm holding him to his yes. own standard. I'm holding his side to their own standard. Now, Alexi McCammon, she's just left Axios and she has suddenly been named the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. And if people don't know who Teen Vogue is, it used to be this like Tiger Beat style magazine, but it's now turned into a sort of like Marxism for teens, right. kind of right. just insane left-wing um, neo-Marxist I gotta read that, that's crazy. And so she's become the editor-in-chief of this. The problem for them is that Alexi McCammon has homophobic and anti-Asian racist tweets in her past that she's made. Now she said, all oh, those tweets were a long time ago, I don't believe that anymore, etc. Uh, 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 because you are someone who has tried to cancel people in the past for their own tweets. Yeah. So Alexi McCammon, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to have to hold you to your own standard. Can't have it both I'm going to have to now go to the advertisers of 
Teen Vogue and say, why do you support this organization that has hired an anti-Asian homophobic racist who they are bringing in at a time in America where we are experiencing a wave of anti-Asian hate crimes? What does this say about Teen Vogue? Will you continue to support this organization with your dollars? Ulta Beauty, everyone knows Ulta, right? If you have a girlfriend, you know who, what Ulta is, right? Um, they just pulled their advertising from Teen Vogue. Mm. Think about that. Wow. If you are a teen magazine that's targeting young women, imagine that Ulta, Ulta is like your number one advertiser. They've pulled all of their advertising because of these tweets. Mm. And again, I don't want to live in a society like this. I and would you have prefer a lot to, do to with live that. in a society that has atonement, that has forgiveness, yeah. that has understanding where people can grow. That's where I want to get. But the only way we're going to get there is for people to understand that cancel culture cuts both ways. And it's as simple as that. It's basic game theory. Yeah, give a taste of their own medicine. Fight yeah. fire with fire. This is like, like anybody, I, I, almost, I said to some people, I was like, guys, you don't, you don't need a PhD in this. Just like go watch Eight Mile and understand. If somebody gives it to you, you gotta give it back. Simple as that. Yeah, get what you give, yeah. Understand, I'll underscore to finish out here. Understand their playbook. Go read Rules for Radicals if you haven't. It's also on Audible. I listened to it on Audible a while ago. So understand their playbook, then use it against them to your advantage. Simple as that. So simple as that. Uh, at Jack Pasovic so that's, on um, Twitter. James, James, real quick, I'll, yes, I'll just yes, add that James Lindsay had a great line about this where he said, look, as a second class citizen, you don't get to set the narrative, but you can throw sand in the gears. Hmm. I like it. At Jack yeah. Pasovic on Twitter, uh, the Antifa coming to, I guess, the the deplorable Amazon. Very soon. In, Available now for pre-order on Amazon.com. I mean, is there anything besides Amazon? or any? Uh, well, we will have direct sales, but yes. Uh, yeah, for okay. right now, it's just up there. Okay, cool. Well, Jack, it's been uh, a real pleasure. Uh, I, I thank you. Thank you for your service, uh, both in... The Navy and just uh, for the work you do every day today. So I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you, Jordan. It was a blast. My brother from the 610.